Good morning. I'm appreciating our vigorous bell ringing, summoning us to worship and welcoming us to this space and this day. This is the second weekend, the second Sunday in Easter. And whether you've been here many times or whether it's your very first time, you are welcome and we're glad to see you. And speaking of welcome, you'll notice all of our letters are in place in our welcome uh, little ledge. Um, So many thanks to Jay Peterson who are making sure that our letters don't fall down. Welcome is a big part of who we are. And so I would encourage all of you, especially in this post-Easter season, um, to make sure that as you come in and as you look around, um, there may be people you haven't seen in a while. Welcome them. If there's someone you don't know or you're not sure of their name, um, ask. Right. If they may want or need a name tag, we can follow up on that. But welcome is a simple, easy way we reach out in love. So I encourage you to continue to do it. Things that are happening, things that are happening today... Right after the service in the Memorial Hall, which is, you can progress actually just even through this on down and around into our education wing, there will be an AED training and other conversation about what we do if there's an emergency. Important for ushers or greeters, but but really important for any of us. So even if um, you are not at this time an usher or greeter, but would like to know how this AED, in fact, we have one here in the sanctuary, sort of to the back there, yep, and um, if you would like to know how that all works, um, that, that again is just to the betterment of all of us, if, if a, a number know how it works, if we would need to use it. So Andrea will be there, and, um, and so please make sure that uh, you go and, and, and do that and get that training. Yes, this screen is out, um, which means you may need to look at this screen. I mean, you could look at that screen, but you'd have to turn around. Um, And it's just the beauty and sometimes the curse of technology that saying things occasionally don't show up for worship like our screens, Um, but but we'll make do. Um, Communion. So first communion will happen next Sunday. And so for those families who have third graders, we will do our retreat today at 11 o'clock. Downstairs, we'll start in the fellowship hall. We'll move up here eventually. Um, but uh, if, if, you, if you didn't know about it, here I am telling you um, and, and letting you know where we'll start out. Downstairs at 11 in the fellowship hall. And so that means next Sunday, we'll have oh, a bunch of excited third graders and families to um, share in the joy of having their First communion, um, so I hope you're all here to support them in that as well. I would ask for prayers for Sharon Peterson, who um, has had surgery um, and has um, an ongoing medical need. Um, prayers for her for diagnosis and treatment, and uh, also for her recovery from some pretty significant surgery um, that means she can't bear weight uh, while she heals. So, and for Leroy too, uh, prayers for sure. This is for our friends in the Orthodox Church, their Easter. Um, so we certainly raise our alleluias to them. Um, and, I, and I would remind you that many in the Ukraine are part of the Orthodox Church. And so if you think of that image of what's happening there and, and the destruction, um, a reminder that resurrection happens even from the rubble. Um, so it's, it's incumbent upon us to give our prayers and our support um, there, as well as all of the places where people are um, needing to leave their homes. And so our prayers for, for people from Afghanistan um, and refugees all over the world who wander um, homeless at this time. I have no other announcements. Um, And so I invite you to rise and look at the screen that makes sense to you for our call to worship. We are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to know and proclaim Jesus Christ, and as disciples, reach out in love. Let us worship the Lord. 
During this Easter season, because we're still considered an Easter season, even in these weeks following the actual Sunday of Easter, we give thanks for baptism. Baptism was the way Jesus um, first realized and felt called to his ministry. It's the way we are called to ministry. And so in Easter, we give thanks every week for it. Um, So I say to you, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia, in the waters of baptism. We've passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For the saving ministry and for this water, let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. And I shared with the Saturday night people, I have trouble reading and pouring, so I'm going to pour first and read second. We thank you, God, for your river of life flowing freely from your throne through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters, you flood us with your mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You opened the gates of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth, send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now, breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst. Cleanse our hearts. Wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is Thine is the Glory. It's number 376. Follow on the screens that have words.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. O God of life, you reach out to us amid our fears with the wounded hands of your risen Son. By your Spirit's breath, revive our faith in your mercy and strengthen us to be the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. It's time for the morning readings. A reading from Acts, the fifth chapter. When they had brought the apostles... They had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him as his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The word of the Lord. (coughs) Let's read Psalm 118 responsively. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Shouts of rejoicing and salvation echo in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord indeed punished me sorely, but did not hand me over to death. The Lord indeed, the righteousness. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Here the righteous may enter. I give you thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. By the Lord, this has been done. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, Lord, save us. We pray to you, Lord, prosper our days. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has given us light. Form a procession with branches up.
to the corners of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God in mercy endures forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise for the gospel. On this, the second Sunday in Easter, we read from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace. Be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Here is this time when... As we come back together from a time of pandemic, we have less children, but the hope is we'll have more children eventually. Um, And so children are always welcome to come up and join me, but this is for the child in all of our hearts. Um, And you can't see this. I wish I I should have given this to um, Peter to put up, but I have in my hand um, this. Actually, we got it from one of those Kinder eggs. And if you look at this item one way, If I hold it one way, it looks like a donkey. But then, if I turn it upside down and hold it another way, it looks like... This is good incentive for people to sit in front. It looks like a chicken. It looks like a chicken. So one way is a donkey, one way is a chicken. And I find that if I look at it one way for for a, a, a length of time, I have trouble seeing it. The other way, right? You've seen those um, maybe on your social media, those visual illusions. So, in today's sermon, we'll talk about one way to think of this week, still in Easter, and yet the story of the disciples in the room, wondering what's happening, thinking one thing has happened, and then Jesus appears, and now they shift in thinking to another way. 
Something different has happened than they originally thought. Thomas is the one who points out that sometimes we come at different times from a shift in thinking one way to another. We all have our time. Um, and so, so you can think of this week as a donkey. Well, it's donkey this way, chicken this way. So uh, I'll have this available after church if you want to try it yourself. Mm, it's kind of a fun thing. Perch it there. So it is true. It is true. Even after last week, it is true the tomb is still empty. It is true that Christ is risen, that death has been defeated, that love wins. It's true that we are a resurrection people, the victory is ours. Nothing on earth will ever be the same again, right? Right? Well, this is the week after. This is the week after the Easter lilies. We still have a few, but they're they're on their way to being less lily-like, as happens. This is the week after the egg hunts and the brunches and the trumpets and the vigils and the alleluias. This is the point in the liturgical year when we take a good, hard look at God's post-resurrection world and think, now what? Now what? I am beyond grateful for this gospel reading from St. John this week. It reminds me that the resurrection story honors questions. Not just affirmation, but questions. Our glorious Easter hymns, notwithstanding the week after, has always been messy, complicated. And I'm not the first to struggle with it. I won't be the last. Struggle seems intrinsic, seems essential to the post-Easter story. What happened? There are two ways that I think the gospel reading today reflects what real life looks like after the empty tomb. First, in our story, Jesus does appear to his disciples. Jesus comes, enters that room somehow, even though the door is locked. Jesus is resurrected, but in our story today, still wounded, right? Jesus isn't as he was before. Something has changed. Jesus' wounded body reminds me that, that some hurts are for keeps. They are not erased. We don't get rid of what happens to our hands and our sides when tragedy strikes. They are markers of pain and loss and horror that don't go away. I, and I wouldn't recommend this as um, Easter evening watching, viewing, but I did watch a documentary about Chernobyl, actually. Um, and on Tuesday, it will mark 36 years, I think, since the disaster, the nuclear reactor meltdown at Chernobyl in Ukraine, where a whole area of devastation happened directly and indirectly. Um, if you remember, there was the, the, the drift of the radiation that affected much more than just the area right around Chernobyl and the nuclear reactor. In the documentary, the focus was on a particular area called the Red Forest. And it's called that because Immediately after the explosion happened from that nuclear reactor and the radiation was sent forth, there was a forest that was impacted directly. And the trees turned red with the interaction with radiation. They have studied, carefully studied this area because, of course, it still remains toxic, right? It remains extremely dangerous for anybody to enter. And what they found is... Interesting in a horrifying way, I guess. They have found that 
the leaf litter, um, and any of the plant material that was sort of initially um, impacted by that radiation is as it was on that day 36 years ago. It hasn't broken down. It hasn't decomposed. The organisms necessary to do that, I realize it's kind of technical, but the funguses, the fungi, and the, the bacteria, that was destroyed too. And so nothing was able to break down. And what we know happens when something decomposes, it provides what's necessary for new life to grow. Now, there has been life happening in the Red Forest, but it's changed it's changed, and some things weren't allowed to change. And so here is Jesus' segue back into the story. Not like the Red Forest, not destructively, but changed so that new life may happen. But the wounds remain even after the resurrection. The fact is, change and growth are slow things, aren't they? I've rarely, if ever, experienced instant transformation change that matters most. It comes sideways or in fits and starts when it's even allowed to happen. This is probably why the earliest Christians referred to their new faith as the way. A way is not a destination. That week following resurrection, they hadn't arrived at full knowledge and understanding and joy and what had happened, but they were on their way, the road to walk. Jesus invites them on a journey. Jesus' resurrected body does retain its scars, and they're not old, they're fresh. Maybe as Thomas puts his fingers there, Jesus winces a little, they still hurt. But the real presence of Jesus is what matters. He says, I'm here. I'm with you. I don't float a few sanitized feet above reality, even after death. I dwell in the heart of things, in your fear, in your wondering, your curiosity, even your doubt. I dwell where you dwell. Because it's our bodies that experience all the things Anger and terror and joy, they happen in our bodies. They happen in Jesus' body, too. The second thing that happens is, is that, that Thomas is able and openly and without anyone telling him to be quiet, expresses doubt. He has doubts. He says, I, I won't believe until I see. In the years following, Thomas has a bad rap in the church. And we've put the, the title Doubting Thomas, which we say in, in a way that's uh, judgmental, don't we? Oh, are you a Doubting Thomas? It's a negative. But in our story, his reluctance, his insistence on physical proof, his late arrival to the joyous belief of his peers is not a flaw. It's just a person yearning for a living encounter. I mean, he wants that breath on him too. He wants to receive the Spirit from Jesus. According to John's Gospel, Thomas has to wait a week, but then Jesus comes. If nothing else, Thomas reassures me that that faith doesn't have to be straightforward. That the, the process, the business of accepting the resurrection, of living it out, of sharing it, is tough and it's okay to waver. It's okay to take your time. It's okay to hope for more, even a visit from Jesus to breathe on you. But as Easter people, we also remember, and we've been doing this a long time, that while we can be for a time in our doubt, and it is okay, we are always, always then pushed to remember what we do as Easter people. We don't stay in the locked room, do we? 
So this week, one of my daughters ran a track meet, and her coach, Coach Hinkhaus, uh, said this, actually put it on the board for all of the athletes to read, not after the track meet, but before the track meet. And coach wrote, please act accordingly as they approach their track meet in the afternoon. He wrote, and by accordingly, I mean reckless, passionate, and with abundant vigor. This was before any athlete ran or threw or jumped, before they tackled the hurdles, which scare me, before they did anything, their coach said to them, I don't really care about the winning. I mean, you do, but the winning is not the most important. Here's what's most important if you're going to act accordingly. It's that you are reckless, passionate, and have abundant vigor. Well, I wish I had that board to write that here. Because while we're in the upper room this week, next week, we need to go forth with that abundant vigor. Leave that room Leave the place of wondering and curiosity and embrace what it might mean to have a changed body as Easter people. The body that says, I am not scared to share what's important to me. I'm not scared to talk to people who are different than me or aren't even here on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night. What does it look like after the tomb? Well, change, but not staying like the Red Forest for eternity in a certain state. Instead, allowing new life to grow, allowing all those things to do their work to promote the decomposition and then growing of new life. This is true that resurrection happens every year all over again. Maybe it be true for each of us. Amen. Our hymn of the day today, and you can remain seated, is, and I've got to find it, oh, come with joy. We will sing verses 1, 4, and 5, and this is a delightful hymn. If it's new to you, I still say sing it with abundant vigor. I invite you to rise in your body or your spirit as we with the whole church confess our faith in the words found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, 
We pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy One, who acts righteously, equip your church as witnesses of your goodness to go and tell others of your abundant love, that they may believe that Jesus is our salvation and life. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew your people's commitment to use resources responsibly and to live well with your creation. Invite us to recognize and nurture signs of resurrection life in the natural world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Direct those who are given human authority to lead with humility and compassion. By your Holy Spirit, channel their attention toward serving those who are most in need. God, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Uphold your children who cry out to you, especially those who are no longer able to return home. Wherever people are overcome by the fear of death, breathe in to them your life and peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Inspire those who lead your people in worship and praise for our musicians, our accompanists, our choir directors, our ringers and singers. With joyful motion and sound, send us forth with praise we cannot keep to ourselves. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And in keeping always with God's commandment to pray for others, we first pray for those who celebrate their birthday this month. We pray for Zoe and for Anne We pray for Mark and Ted. We keep Brayden, Julie, and Maureen in our prayers. We also pray for the mission and ministry of St. John Lutheran Church in Avoca, Wisconsin. We keep Sharon and Leroy in our prayers. And now we fill this place with the prayers of our heart, maybe unspoken, but always heard. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us the words of your saints who, like Thomas, boldly confessed your Son as Lord and God. With Jesus, our leader, empower us to live according to his ways. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And as you sit for our offering, a a friendly wave wave or smile to your neighbor is always a good thing. We now take the morning offering.
I invite you to rise. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one as we are by the Holy Spirit, let us now pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The risen Christ dwells with us here. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come. You may be seated. This morning, we will receive communion up front. Ushers will indicate when you come forward. You'll receive a wafer, and we have a gluten-free alternative if you need. Simply ask. Following the wafer reception, you can take and eat it. And then Jim will have the cups. There's dark wine in some, lighter juice in others. Indicate which you prefer. You take and drink, and then on your way back to your seats, there are baskets. You can put your cup in the baskets. Come, for all is ready.
rise. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup, We have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending hymn this morning is Hallelujah, Jesus Lives. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 5. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. I suppose we can say it again. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 